I think Albanese's response to what's happening in Gaza has underlined the way in which uh, you know, stands in this long, ignominious line of uh, Labor Party renegades who you know, have ditched some of their previous principles and uh, political positions, um, either in pursuit of the well-trodden path of trying to boost their own individual careers uh, or simply um, with the idea that this is what was necessary to get into government. Um, so uh, Albanese's transformation, I think, is a, is a common one in that respect. But um, just to give a few little examples, I mean, I think probably most people in Sydney, I don't know if it's circulated, um, interstate have seen by now the footage of Albanese speaking at a pro-Palestine demonstration, I think in about 2001, looked like it was during the, uh, the first intifada, where he's, he's actually speaking in support of the Palestinians against um, the brutality of Israel. And to go from that to today being the person who is the target of demonstrations for you know, being so single-mindedly and wholeheartedly supportive of Israel um, is a 180-degree turn. And I think that same kind of shift from Albanese, um, you can see around a whole series of issues. Uh, so for instance, you know, he was once uh, defined by opposition to uranium mining and campaigned around that kind of issue, whereas today he's uh, you know, drumming up support for nuclear submarines in Australia, um, you know, joining the AUKUS pact, um, you know, opening new uh, waste dumps for the uranium that's going to be in those uh, nuclear submarines when Australia gets them and more wholeheartedly joining the, um, the kind of nuclear cycle. Uh, in 2015 at the Labor Party conference, Albanese actually voted against um, turnbacks of refugee boats, saying he could never bring himself to do something like that. Uh, now he's um, you know, trying to shut the borders to almost perhaps anyone from a series of countries uh, you might have seen recently, like in, including um, Iran and Iraq, you know, where people uh, might be at risk of be becoming uh, asylum seekers that Australia couldn't return um, to danger. Uh, you know, is enforcing the full kind of suite of the border protection me measures in terms of boat turnbacks and uh, sending people to Nauru that the, um, the previous Liberal government um, introduced. Uh, and I could go on for a very long time, but I don't want to bore you with um, you know, uh, going in detail into Albanese's um, you know, uh, personal political career. Um, but I think the point is that he, he began his career as a, in politics as a man of the left in the sense that he was, a, um, he was known as a factional kind of power broker for um, what, what, was, um, what was termed the hard left in New South Wales. It's probably a bit of an unfair com um, compliment to give them to say that they were hard left, but in any case, he was very much a, a part of the, the left faction. Um, and while it's true, like he was always, you know, very much about being within the Labor Party and playing the, the factional numbers game, um, and so at that level, you know, we don't want to overstate his um, left-wing credentials. Um, it is the case that often what that meant was taking some sort of a stand against the right faction within the party and um, you know, fighting some of their, um, their policies. Uh, whereas if you look at Albanese now, when he actually took over the Labor leadership um, from Shorten, he actually made a point of taking Labor to the right, of um, adopting the small target strategy that Labor took to the last federal election and dumping a whole series of policies that Shorten, ironically, was from the right of the Labor Party, um, had, had said he was going to introduce if, if, if he'd won the um, 2019 election, you know, including measures around um, uh, negative gearing of housing, cutting some of the tax breaks for housing investors, and some modest sort of measures um, to tax the rich and fund uh, social services. Um, I think more generally, like Albanese becoming leader of the Labor Party and Prime Minister, um, has really accepted that taking that position means um, being willing to serve the interests uh, of the rich and powerful. So I think you can see his support for Israel in, in that kind of context, that it um, you know, continues a long-standing position of um, you know, the Australian kind of foreign policy uh, establishment, the, the state um, apparatus in Australia, uh, of support for the US alliance. Um, and Israel is of a piece with his you know, support for the, um, the, the AUKUS alliance, for the US alliance, um, you know, having, for instance, with AUKUS backed the, the idea of acquiring nuclear submarines with a, a turnaround time of only of less than 24 hours to actually uh, make that decision after Morrison um, let him into the, to the deal. And you know, in fact, he didn't hesitate when he heard about the price tag of $368 billion um, either. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think at that level, uh, Albanese is a, a familiar figure in the sense that he's um, you know, someone who might have talked left at one point, but actually has abandoned the whole series of those positions um, in, in moving to the right. Um, and I think it's important to see that this is not, it's not just a personal failing, it's not just something that um, Albanese was a, a weak individual uh, or whatever. It's a very common story in terms of the Labor Party. Um, again, just to give one example, 
um, who some people might be familiar with, um, is Peter Garrett, who you know, established his name as you know, um, in Midnight Oil and as an environmental campaigner. Actually, his first party he was associated with was the Nuclear um, Disarmament Party in the 1980s. But when he joined the Labor Party, um, got elected as an MP, actually became the Environment Minister, he went from someone who had made his name opposing uranium mines and saying that he wanted a nuclear-free uh, Australia uh, to being someone who approved a, a new uranium mine in the Four Mile um, Mine when he became the Environment Minister. So again, a 180 on his you know, previous kind of political principles of what he actually sort of stood for. Um, I guess what I want to talk about is, uh, in terms of Albanese's you know, right-wing politics, um, and this familiar kind of story, how uh, firstly, I think it's a, a product of um, the way that Labor actually sets out to, um, to run the system, to manage capitalism. It's part of the, the DNA of the, um, it's a product of part of the DNA of the Labor Party. Um, but also I want to just finish by talking about, um, you know, even though Labor is a party that uh, adopts very right-wing policies like this, um, you know, the way in which there are also contradictions inside the Labor Party because of the kind of um, party that it is that we, that we should seek to, um, to work on in terms of trying to build the movement for Palestine or the, the left more broadly. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's true from the inception of the Labor Party that, um, you know, Labor MPs have repeatedly, um, as Albanese and Garrett and others have done, betrayed the, the trade unionists and the party members um, who you know, worked for them and elected them um, and, and supported them. Um, and there's a very, very long uh, history of that. So if you go right back to the beginning of the, the Labor Party in, um, in New South Wales, of what was even properly uh, the Labor Party, um, the new party in 1893 was actually forced to expel 31 of the 35 um, of the first MPs that they had elected. Uh, after they re refused to withdraw support for a government that was sending in um, the police, um, had imprisoned um, seven miners' leaders in an effort to break a, a strike, um, you know, a miners' strike in New South Wales. Um, so, you know, even back in 1993, very early days of the Labor Party, you had that phenomenon of MPs, um, you know, betraying the principles they'd been sent into Parliament to actually put into practice. Um, and uh, not not that long after that period. Um, there's a very famous book that um, Dear Gordon Child wrote, How Labor Governs, where he tried to, um, tried to look at this uh, sort of experience um, you know, of, yeah, of, of Labor MPs uh, elected who betrayed the, um, the workers and the, and the, um, the union movement. Um, and he, there's an there's a, you know, interesting quote, I think, this is back from 1923, where he said that uh, the fact is that possessed of a substantial salary, a gold pass on the railways, um, that might be one thing that's changed, uh, and other privileges, Surrounded by the middle class atmosphere of parliament, the workers' representative, Labor MPs, uh, are liable to get out of touch with the rank and file that put them in the legislature and to think more of keeping their seat and scoring political points than of carrying out the ideals uh, they were sent in pa into parliament to give um, effect to. Um, and, and yeah, as I said, I think that, that's a result of something that's intrinsic to the kind of party that Labor is. Um, in particular, that Labor's formed as a party that's actually dedicated to. Uh, you know, winning government and, and managing um, capitalism. Uh, so its, its whole aim is about trying to uh, use the state to actually deliver reforms um, that are in the interests of uh, working class people, um, and as some put it, to civilise capitalism. You know, you know, the idea that you could, because you're in government, whether you could use, um, or you could stop perhaps the state, you know, cracking down on workers' demonstrations, breaking strikes, or you could use the vacuum you control government to expand spending that was going into uh, health services or education, um, you know, perhaps even introduce industrial relations laws to um, you know, put things a little bit more in unions and workers' interests when it came to the, um, you know, the system of um, you know, industrial relations and strikes and, and so on. Um, I think that, that general approach, I think, is one that we describe as reformism, that Labor um, you know, thinks there's problems in the world, but that you can actually do something to reform the system, to improve people's lives through getting into government um, and trying to change things. Um, but I think there's a basic problem with that, that whole idea, um, which is that like, we don't live um, in a real democratic society. We live in a capitalist democracy where um, the government doesn't actually control uh, the bulk of the economy. Um, so what that means is that the, um, you know, in a capitalist society you've got private companies, um, billionaires, millionaires um, actually control the bulk of, um, of economic activity. So maybe, maybe the state controls in Australia 30-35% um, 
you know, uh, of GDP, but most of the investment, most of the economic activity is, is controlled by, by, um, by private businesses. And what that means is that they have enormous power um, to actually discipline governments if they, if they choose to. And they can close down factories, refuse to invest, they can sack thousands of workers, um, they can uh, use all kinds of economic levers to create chaos, um, shortages and so on if they want to try and damage the government. Um, and I think the truth is that um, all capitalist governments come to realise, and Labor certainly came to realise a long time ago, that uh, their success as a government coming to power through a uh, capitalist parliament uh, relies on the success of the private sector, of the private capitalist economy, if they're actually going to, you know, uh, be able to, if you know, there's going to be employment, the investment that's actually required to uh, make the economy actually function. Uh, I think what that, what that means is that Labor governments um, find that they have to actually create the conditions that favour um, capitalist profitability, that, you know, conditions where uh, companies can, you know, make healthy profits. Uh, yeah, um, and so I think the result of that has been that pretty much every Labor government um, has ended up um, either attacking or betraying uh, its, its basic supporters in terms of, you know, the Labor um, movement or the, the working class uh, in general. Um, and, you know, again, you could pretty much go through every Labor government uh, and look at, at some of those betrayals. Um, but I think uh, like it's, ex it's especially the case in terms of, um, and you see it very sharply in terms of um, situations of economic crisis. So um, take the one government that people might, uh, you know, perhaps there's a, uh, there's a perception, I think, is one of the um, more radical uh, Labor governments, the, the Whitlam government. Um, in 1974, um, in when the economic crisis hit Australia seriously, uh, inflation jumped to 22% and unemployment began uh, to increase. Uh, the first instinct of the Labor Treasurer at the time was to try and maintain their, what they called their reform program, to try and you know, maintain the level of spending. Perhaps they could spend their way out of the problem, um, might even be able to increase the, the size of the state, the, um, the programs that the government was running to deal with the situation. But they found pretty quickly that didn't actually work. Um, and um, so Jim Cairns, who was the, the Treasurer at the time, um, concluded that, uh, as he said, we live in a society where the things that happen as a whole are taking place in the private sector. And if the government was going to uh, deliver jobs, was going to get itself out of the problems, it had to help the private sector, the capitalists, um, to be able to restore um, you know, health to their levels of profitability. Uh, you know, and that meant, of course, the government had to go on an austerity program, had to introduce cuts, um, effectively introduce the first economic rationalist um, budget. Um, and so I think some of that history is important because if you, I think if you look at Albanese and Labor today, um, the truth is they, they've long, a long time ago accepted that there's no real point. They're not really going to even attempt to seriously um, you know, buck the market, to seriously um, you know, uh, challenge capitalism. Um, yeah, and, and that's meant having to drive through a whole series of attacks on workers' living standards, unions, uh, and so on. Um, you know, pivotal point obviously was the um, situation with the Hawke and Labor governments that actually played a mate, like basically introduced neoliberal um, economic policies to Australia and you know, swathes of privatisation did a huge amount to uh, cripple union power, um, you know, a form of economic restructuring that was designed to deliver a profitable capitalist economy um, and, and healthy profits for business. Um, and Albanese is you know, part of the legacy of that, um, that kind of rotten tradition. So I think in terms of his own attitude to business, you can see that. So, um, so shortly, um, shortly after he won the election in 2022, the, um, the Australian actually reported that um, a colleague and friend had told the, um, the Australian newspaper that Albanese has been quietly building relationships with the big end of town for the past 10 years. Um, it started a whole inner circle of um, you know, senior business leaders that uh, you know, he was in regular contact with, you know, personal friends or um, that he went out of his way to spend his time consulting about their wishes and their, their interests. Um, people like Lindsay Fox, the, the transport um, magnate, um, you know, some of, the, some of the perhaps supposedly more progressive capitalists like Mike Cannon-Brooks, um, as well as um, uh, Rod Eddington, who's been a long time kind of Labor Party pro-business um, business kind of figure, uh, the Commonwealth Bank chief, exe chief executive, um, and also actually um, Alan Joyce, before he retired, as the head of Qantas, who apparently every time he was in Canberra, Albanese cleared his schedule so he could make sure he could sit down with Alan Joyce and, um, and have a chat and kick his ear. Um, uh, to, to reflect this, in 2008, um, before he became Labor leader, Albanese actually said, we respect and celebrate the importance of individual enterprise and the efforts of, and importance of the business community. 
Um, and I think that, that kind of um, approach goes a long way to explaining why Albanese is so right-wing, that he's accepted that if he's going to be Prime Minister and run government, that Labor has to accept the interests of, um, of big business. So I mean, you look at climate change, for instance, it's very, it's very clear in that way. Uh, you know, the fossil fuel mining companies are a major part of Australian capitalism, and so Albanese and the Labor government is going to make sure that they do you know, what it takes to actually make sure that they can continue to increase their profits, open new mines, and so on. And I think that's at the heart of the, the problem that Labor's got around climate change. They're not prepared to actually challenge business interests. Um, and as I said, it's the same thing in terms of the attitude about um, you know, US imperialism, the US alliance, um, and Israel, that you know, Labor accepts the, um, the basic kind of attitude of the um, you know, kind of security establishment and state institutions in Australia, instead of in any way working to challenge any of those things, they accept that that's what a, um, a Labor government has to do. Um, but I want to, um, to finish also by talking about how, I mean, it's true Albanese is very right wing because of, you know, the kind of nature of the party that the Labor Party is. Um, but I also think that it's important to see that, um, that Labor also rests on a contradiction, um, that it's committed to running capitalism and managing the system, but at the same time it's the party of the trade unions um, and it, its electoral support um, still you know, very heavily rests on um, more class-conscious workers um, and working-class people in, in, this, in society who want to actually see some sort of change. And that's quite different to the, the Liberal Party, you know, which I think um, you know, has its main base in terms of the, the middle class, the, the wealthy, um, small business people, um, you know, people who accept um, all the pro-capitalist ideas about you know, hard work and individual enterprise if you're going to get ahead, um, as well as you know, all the reactionary kind of racist, sexist and transphobic kind of ideas that pretty much summed up in a figure like Peter Dutton. Um, but I think that... That fact that Labor actually, as we would call it, a capitalist workers' party, like it's committed to capitalism, but actually has a base um, electorally and in terms of um, who makes up the party in, in the trade unions and, and the working class, um, means that Labor, firstly, they have to offer some kind of modest changes um, to deliver things for their, their base in terms of the trade union leaders. Um, so, you know, you've seen Labor under Albanese, you know, well, generally very right wing. They'll give a few little crumbs in terms of um, some changes around Labor hire, for instance. Um, the pay increases for aged care workers, like some modest kind of changes, um, you know, delivered to, to unions. Um, but I think what the other thing it means, I think, is that uh, there's a possibility of cracks between Labor governments um, and, on the other hand, trade unionists, uh, working class people and the left, um, between the people who expect Labor to deliver change and what Labor actually delivers. Um, so it's a very clear example, I think, about about that around um, what, what we've seen around Palestine, um, where you've got large numbers of people in the Arab and Muslim communities. Um, you know, one particular concentration of that is in Western Sydney, people who voted for Albanese, you know, it's a series of Labor seats there and Labor MPs, um, who are now like pretty, you know, just totally horrified and outraged about um, the things that the Labor government has actually done um, over Gaza. Um, but I also think, um, you know, as, as tremendous as those, um, you know, 10, 000, tens of thousands of people marching and the fact that Muslim leaders, you know, wanted, were uh, boycotting um, iftars with uh, Labor, New South Wales and Victorian um, premiers and leaders as a result of what Labor's done over Gaza. Um, it's also the case that if you're actually going to get change, whether it's over, you know, Albanese's position on um, Israel and Gaza or, or any other issue, actually, we need far greater pressure. Like, we need... Um, you know, we're going to need a much bigger movement to actually break um, Albanese. Um, and that means that we have to actually deepen the level of opposition beyond the existing people who um, perhaps concentrated in the Muslim and Arab community and the left who are, you know, disgusted with Albanese um, over Gaza. Uh, and that means we can't afford to dismiss everyone who, you know, voted for Albanese, is in the Labor Party or might be um, trade union members. Like, I think... Um, well, we want actually dissenting Labor Party members, MPs, um, trade union leaders actually speaking out at Palestine demonstrations like as part of the movement. And I think, I think that will strengthen the movement as a whole. Firstly, because it means that it adds to the legitimacy of the, the protests and the movement to actually have people who are in the Labor Party, the party with Albanese, speaking against um, his position, people from the trade unions, um, you know, who represent still you know, something like a million uh, members actually taking a position against um, what the Labor government, their government uh, in many ways, is, is actually doing. Um, and I think that will allow us, that should allow us to pull actually more people from the unions, union members, um, people who look to Labor, who might have voted for Labor, uh, into the movement, into uh, the demonstrations. Um, because I think 
you know, as much as there's a radical minority of people and a minority of people who are very outraged and angry about what's happened in Gaza, it's still the case that even many of those people, certainly people uh, in general in society, um, still believe that the only realistic way to actually win change is either having Labor in power or having Labor in power, perhaps with some sort of coalition with the Greens or independents, that it's got to be through some sort of electoral constellation that, um, that, that change will actually become, um, will actually come. Um, and the only way to, to crack that, I think, is to actually draw more people into struggle against um, the Labor government um, and, and the Labor leadership. Um, and I think you know, we have to be confident that you know, pulling sections of the unions and the Labor Party into the movement will actually build a bigger movement, confident in the, in the way that um, you know, if people are actually involved in struggle, particularly where there's a movement powerful enough to win actual victories, um, that people are actually radicalised by that process um, and drawn to the left um, as a result. Um, because I think another reason, actually, that Albanese is so right-wing, actually, is the decline of trade union membership, the decline of um, trade union militancy, the level of strikes, uh, and so on. The fact that there haven't been powerful social movements to actually discipline, um, you know, the Labor government. Um, he's been able to get away without any real pressure um, of, of a series of very right-wing uh, kind of policies. Um, and while I think, obviously, we never rely on Labor MPs or trade union officials to actually deliver the change that we need. If we draw you know, the people who they represent, the rank and file, into struggle, that is a thing that can actually force them to deliver um, some modest kind of changes. Um, I think that point's quite important, just to finish that, because um, you know, it's not, we don't think that, and it's not the case that actually that you know, we're going to change things through electing more Greens or you know, changing the constellation of Parliament. The thing that actually has delivered change, if you look at Australian history, whether it's under Labor or Liberal governments, is, is a level of, of struggle outside society, the level of class struggle. Um, and therefore, the kind of organisation we need, the kind of party, um, the kind of movement is one that's actually committed to, to building the class struggle and is focused on that, not looking to you know, elections or, um, or Parliament as a thing that's actually going to deliver change. And I think in that respect, we want to pull sections of the Labor Party, the union movement, as, you know, as much of the working class as we can into building the, the, more, the powerful movement that we need. And that's the way to actually shift politics in terms of you know, Albanese or whatever government that we face and actually winning the kind of change we need.